What do you think? I think we're dead meat. Real dead meat. You're dead meat! Go ahead and laugh, you guys. If I ever find a little bastard, it's this. It's dead meat. Welcome to the Dead Meat Podcast, an extension of the YouTube channel Dead Meat. I'm James. I'm Chelsea, and we're boyfriend and girlfriend, and we like to get scared together. Yeah, we do. Today, we're going to do an episode that many people have requested, many people have been eagerly waiting for. We're going to talk about the final girl. Yeah, the final girl trope. Yes. And we're doing this one a little differently. We're going to do this one kind of like we do our movie reviews for movies that have come out recently or that are still in theaters where this isn't going to be edited. It's going to be, if you're watching the video version, it's just the two videos of us side by side, which a lot of you have said you like better for some reason. So <laughs> sure, it's easier for me. So that's fine. Yeah. Uh, oh, I forgot that I'm always going to be on camera. Exactly. Then, yeah. So. You can't be fucking around while I'm talking and vice versa. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's if, if you're listening to it, there's not going to be much of a difference. But if you're watching, there might be points where I do feel like I need to cut stuff out. Because sometimes we'll go on tangents and, you know, if the episode's getting long, <laughs> <laughs> I'll cut it out. So there might be jump cuts if we kind of go off on like an off topic. Thing. Just deal with it. Yeah. It's because Chelsea's going to be getting surgery on her eyes, some LASIK surgery. So. Oh, I, yeah. I don't have time to edit this. So we don't have time to edit it. She's getting lasers in her eyes. Getting lasers. That's why I have glasses on. Yeah. Yep. You look cute. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, if people like this better... We can do this. Let us know. Yeah. It's Let us know. Okay. So today's episode is about a topic that has been prevalent on the kill count since its inception. I have always, since I pretty sure episode one, have referenced the final girl. Mm -hmm. It is maybe the most well known trope of horror movies. I think so. Other than perhaps running victim is caught up to by walking killer. Sure. <laughs> like that might be the only one that edges it out, but everyone knows what the final girl is, even people who uh, aren't diehard fans of the genre. Yeah, I think, you know, you could ask anyone who isn't a horror fan to describe what the final girl is, and you'd basically get, I think, the same description. They would say she's a strong girl. She's smart, definitely smarter than her friends, and <laughs> she's the good girl, quote unquote. Yeah, in most cases. Yeah. And I, I tried thinking of a way to structure this episode because it's kind of a nebulous concept like how do you do an episode about a trope mm -hmm. and i thought like should we just talk about you know different final girls like a list of them or do we talk about it in like a you know more of our own thoughts like a tv tropes kind of way where we just kind of spitball our ideas about this concept but i think what made more sense and what seemed a little bit more substantial was talking about where this term came from because the phrase final girl is from a specific place and a specific person, which I think a lot of people may not know. Yeah. And I thought it would make a lot more sense for this episode to kind of go through the essay that this term came from. And don't let that <laughs> scare you. It's not boring. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if you if you're interested in, um, you know, possibly studying horror or if you're in college and your college offers a horror class, which many colleges do. Surprised at how many horror professors we've even met through the channel who yeah. have commented and say that they like our videos. <laughs> <laughs> but this is this is one of the first things you're gonna read is this essay called Her Body Himself by Carol Clover. And it's from the book Men, Women and Chainsaws, which we've talked about before on the podcast. Um, it's awesome. It's it's this is horror through a gender studies lens through a feminist lens don't let that scare you hold up hold up hold up pump okay. the brakes because i know some of you are like fuck this episode's gonna be all about this whiny lady fucking SJW. crying about <laughs> how horror is misogynist and how horror is offensive that's not what this is nope. this carol clover first of all she rules she's still a professor if any of you have had her, please tell me stories about oh, her because be so I cool. adore her. She currently teaches Scandinavian studies at UC Berkeley, <laughs> um, but she's also a film professor. And uh, she wrote this book because she I, she says in the, in the foreword to this that a friend of hers took her to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And before that, she had explicitly avoided 
horror and and more like kind of low grade horror like slasher exploitation because she you know she being a woman and you know being a feminist had the same kind of concept that I think a lot of of feminists do where you know they think oh I don't I have no interest in seeing an exploitation movie because it's so violent it's it's gratuitous violence against women Eh. but then she saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre and was like there's so much more to this, I think, than people realize. And then she got obsessed with slasher movies and has seen fucking every slasher movie ever. Yeah. Like, Carol Clover knows her shit. And specifically, she knows low-grade horror that other people dismiss as not being anything worth studying. Yeah. And I know that just even at the as soon as we bring up gender studies or feminism or just anything having to even broach that subject a lot of people get squeamish yeah i'm asking you to just put your squeamishness on hold we're not this isn't a political podcast we're not going to be attacking anyone like this is not something like an ideological uh argument no. being made this is simply a critical lens through which we will temporarily be viewing these movies. Right. And it's okay if you disagree with some of the things it says or with all of the things it says, but give yourself a chance to maybe just expose yourself to thinking that you might not otherwise normally have. I try to do that all the time. I always try to to read things that I don't necessarily agree with just to have that exposure and to just open up your mind a little bit. And again, it's okay if you disagree and uh, like we're not even necessarily saying this is the, the right way to or view the only horror. way. Let's see. I have a quote from early on in her essay that I'll read that I think will kind of set the tone for how she feels about the the genre. So here we go. This is from the book's introduction. Horror's misogyny is a far more complicated matter than the bloodlust, quote-unquote, formula would have it. If I err in the chapters that follow on the side of complication, it is because I believe that the standard critique of horror as straightforward, sadistic misogyny itself needs not only a critical, but political interrogation. Like others before me, I discovered that there are in horror moments and works of great humor, formal brilliance, political intelligence, psychological depth, and above all, a kind of kinky creativity that is simply not available in any other stripe of filmmaking. So yeah. that's kind of what this is going to be. Um, even if there are points where she's critical of the genre, as you know, we all should be. Like, yeah. you can love something and critique it. Yeah, I think it's important. to. Uh, that's why one of the, the things that I never like to do is give like the numerical rating of a movie because I feel like it just strips away any nuance. I prefer to always say... Here are things I like about this. Here are things I don't. And rarely will you have a work of art where it's all one or the other. And I think that's a good challenge to yourself as a consumer of art and media is to always be like, okay, what's one thing, even though I fucking love this movie, what's one thing that could be better that I didn't really care for? Even if it's just like a scene or a line. And similarly, if you fucking hate a movie, what's one thing they did well? You can always find one thing. Movies are collaborations of hundreds of people sometimes. And so, like, <laughs> some of those people had to been doing a good job, even if the, the end product is something you really don't like. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's fair. Something else about this book that I think is really important to know is that Carol Clover specifically is really interested in the male audience's relationship to horror. Because as she's seeing horror movies, she's like, Everyone in this theater is a young dude. Yeah, and, and we should say this essay and this book come out in the early 90s? This is 1992. Okay, is when this collection yeah. comes out. So maybe this was written a little earlier, but... Yeah, I think, you know, the essays, she's writing them over the course of years. And the book itself is released in 1992. So. Yeah, so the genre is obviously very, very different. different. Uh, I, I actually, when we get to the end, I have a... There's a really good essay that was on Medium... That is an update to the final girl theory that someone wrote and kind of is, gives examples of more modern movies to see if they hold up to her idea of how the genre presents women. And so I'll link to that because it addresses a lot of questions you might have yeah. concerning this and how dated some of this might feel. So, again, her perspective and her approach is going to be primarily with movies that came out in the 80s, which we would consider, I think most people would consider like the heyday of slasher films, which was, you know all the sequels to all those big franchises that we all love, the Friday the 13th, 
the Nightmare on Elm Streets, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, her her bookends here, she specifies like explicitly the kinds of horror she's talking about, slasher specifically in in this chapter at least, beginning in 1974 with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then becoming, like, fully coming into its own with Halloween in 1978, which coincidentally are the two movies that came back to back in our, like, important horror movies episode. Yeah. I think she kind of agrees with us where it's like these two, you don't really have one without the other, and you don't have either of them without Psycho. She talks a lot about Psycho in this mm-hmm. chapter, too, and how Psycho kind of lays a groundwork, and it's not a slasher, but you don't have slasher movies yeah, without. it's like a proto slasher. Sure, yeah, but it isn't like the classic. You got, you know, not Final Girl. It's not. It's not as a low grade, like Psycho's art. These were not considered <laughs> art when they came out. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Also, I do have uh, that same document up on my phone. So okay, just cool. so you know. Yeah. So yeah. So again, she is concerned mostly with the male audience's relationship to horror because you know back then, and I still probably the case now if the demographics of your channel are any. Yeah. Uh, currently, my demogra- my viewing demographics on Dead Meat are something like eighty five percent male. Yeah. Fifteen percent female. Right. Which is. <laughs> and you know Crazy. who knows how analogous that is to the horror genre in general. Like you know we go to horror conventions. There's plenty of women and other genders there but i would say that my channel probably ha- is more representative of specifically the slasher audience just because that's what the kill count necessarily has to cover i'm, I'm never covering slashers, all these movies yeah. like the conjuring or other psychological supernatural horror movies which i believe carol clover mentions in her book and other essays does have a higher percentage of female audience yes there's a whole chapter about possession movies in this yeah yeah yeah, and for whatever reason, those movies tend to draw a higher uh, portion of female viewers. Right. Whereas the slasher seems to be very male. Right. And so then, yeah, your audience on the channel is very much mostly male. Yeah. Although we see and appreciate you other genders. That's right. We Don't love worry. you. We love everyone. But so, yeah, that's important because, you know, going forward, we're going to be talking a lot about how men watch these movies. Mm-hmm. So before you're like, well, what the fuck? It's, you know, that's she's like, I have to focus on this. Like, why is it just men watching these so prominently? Yeah, because if you think about it from like a, like a kind of scientific method point of view, there are roughly equal amounts of men and women on the earth right. in the country and so the default assumption for everything should be half and half and when there is a discrepancy it's 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 valid to question why yes and why. that discrepancy becomes extra interesting and this is why the final girl chapter and this her body himself chapter is a thing this is basically the core of the essay it's super weird when <laughs> a genre's majority audience is male but all of the protagonists are female. Mm-hmm. For the most part, the protagonists are female. Yeah, the and final girl. The yeah. final girl. So why, her whole essay is basically wondering, well, why is this the case? Because most other movies, like at the time, mm-hmm. I think now we're going through kind of a change where we do have more female main characters. But at the time, you have mostly male characters and everything else. Yeah, and like compare that to the action genre, if you will, which probably also has a higher percentage of male audience than female. But those heroes are almost always men. Yeah, because this is what the age. She's talking about the eighties. Yeah, especially she, she 80s talks about Rambo movies. a little bit mm-hmm. in this chapter, and um, yeah, so yeah, super hyper masculine male stars. So yeah, what is it about horror? that makes it so the uh the usual is a primary female character mm-hmm. with which we identify with i don't know yeah We're that, gonna get into that it. basically like why do men unquestioningly identify with a woman in these movies like mm-hmm. why is that a thing why is no one weirded out by it you know why <laughs> why do we take it so for granted and no one really questions it we all just kind of accept yeah the final girl Mm-hmm. That's a thing. Yeah. And it's been a thing for decades now. <laughs> so basically, okay, so she uses, like we said before, she uses Psycho as kind of a forefather to these slashers. And uh, this is a quote. The killer is a psychotic product of a sick family, but still recognizably human. 
The victim is a beautiful, sexually active woman. The location is not home at a terrible place, capital T, capital P, which is another trope that she talks about. I kind of skipped all that stuff because this would have been uh, four hours long. The weapon something other than a gun. The attack is registered from the victim's point of view and comes with shocking suddenness. So, yeah, we don't have slashers without Psycho. And that kind of is like, you know, she really starts to lay out this kind of checklist for what qualifies as a slasher yeah. in her mind. Victims in slashers are infamously sexually active teens. Both men and women are punished for their transgressions. Murder after sex is a genre staple. Or during sex. Or during sex. Many of the Friday the 13th movies. Oh, Kevin Bacon. (laughs) No, that's after. Oh, is it? That's post-coital? Yeah, during is in Friday the 13th Part 2 when Sandra and Jeff get speared together in a a kill that's reminiscent of Bay of Blood. And I'm also thinking of Friday the 13th uh, Part 9, Jason Goes to Hell, that fucking tent. People are having very explicit sex in a uh, pole comes in and splits the girl in half while she's on top of the dude. Oh, fuck. I think yeah. she talks about part two in this that essay. That makes sense, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, again, that's another trope that I think people who don't even know horror know. Like, yeah. if you have sex, you die. I think maybe S- people know because of Scream. Scream, for sure. Yeah. You do drugs, you drink, you yeah. have sex, you die. Can never have sex. Oh! No, no! Oh! Big no-no! Randy. However... Men are almost always killed quickly, and we barely see him react. They're also more often to die because of stupid mistakes like trespassing or getting in the killer's way. Mm. Do you find that's often the case? Um, Again, this isn't always. It's just often. We get the men out of the way, and they're killed pretty quickly. Yeah. Whereas women get prolonged deaths. They're filmed at close range and it's graphic. They're also often killed just for the rage that their womanhood elicits. Think Norman Bates or other killers who are presented with gender confusion. And my, like Michael Myers, I thought of the beginning of Halloween because Michael Myers sees his sister topless. She's just had sex, I think, with her boyfriend. Mm-hmm. And very quickly. Yeah, that's, <laughs> They like that's go upstairs right. and then like 20 seconds later, he's like leaving, that buttoning up great. his pants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, see you later, babe. But it's something about her sexuality that enrages him. It's just her being a woman and having boobs <laughs> is what makes him snap and kill her this focus on women's terror and why women's deaths are so drawn out versus men's is more complicated than it seems on the surface or so argues clover so i think a criticism that people often have of horror is that it just relishes in women's deaths i think that's a problem people often have with horror is that it feels very exploitive or yeah like men you know often again i think over the years that's become less and less of the case but when you think back to, I'm even thinking of um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I think the guys die pretty quickly. Uh, so I can't speak for like the relative uh, like drawn outness of deaths between genders because I I just can't think right now. I have so much data in yeah. my head that's hard to parse through. It is something though that a lot of people comment on on the videos. I believe I think there's only been a single movie I've covered with more female victims than male. Usually there are there are more men than women killed and oftentimes many more men mm-hmm. than women killed. And I see a lot of comments saying like that's sexist that more men get killed oh, weird. or that like I thought women always got killed more in horror movies. Uh why why is it always more men? Yeah. And so uh, I think part of that might be that a lot of the movies I cover come after this point of uh, this decade that she's studying. But another thing is that, I, and and this is a question I, I've been all, I always wanted to address this because people are always like, why why are there so many more men dying on your channel than than women? And I think a big part of that is is because in a lot of these movies where they want a higher body count, they just kill nameless people, oftentimes cops security guards other things like that and those roles are always men. men she talks about this yeah clover talks a lot about how often the men in these movies are their cops their dads their yeah security guards mm-hmm. they're yeah and you know again and especially when she's writing this those are roles and jobs held by men so it makes sense that there's more men dying in these kinds of movies because it's 
men holding these jobs where they're going to get killed by the murderer running around. Yeah, and the the method by which I count kills on the kill count uh, may be doing a disservice to just, or just might be uh, setting up a certain perspective because I count any kill that I see. Even though you could argue these background characters and bodies that we see or these nameless cops and security guards, they're not really characters, you know? And I wonder what the difference would be in that gender breakdown if you just looked at actually substantial characters, characters who had lines and a little bit of development and who didn't just show up and got killed. Mm -hmm. And especially like with the Purge movies, which I'm covering at the time of this recording, there's just like insane. It's like. 90 dudes and five girls but it's just because like their bodies in the background and it's just like i feel like filmmakers are often like well just just throw all these dudes over there and uh yeah so i i I feel like it would be more equitable if you just looked at characters yeah i think it's it's something where more often men are treated as cannon fodder and that's something where the movie um mad max fury road Mm -hmm. was something i really liked about it is that women got to be cannon fodder in that movie yeah i thought that was so fascinating which again and this is another comment that are are on uh all these videos that are like feminists say that like it's sexist if more women die than men and that's not that's not case. true dude i i feel like <laughs> feminists were very excited for mad max because it was like we're getting treated like men we're just being tossed like tossed around and killed and <laughs> like you know we're it, it truly felt like equal treatment because we were just <laughs> being used as like bodies yeah, yeah might as well do that but then there's also a difference uh, because I got, and allow me to just wax a little bit about sure. comments on kill counts, because, you know, a lot of the people viewing and listening to this have been part of that conversation. Yeah. So with the Saw 3 kill count, or Saw 3D, I'm sorry, I mentioned that the movie seems kind of angry towards women, and I got a lot of comments being like, what, just because a lot of women died? Uh, more wh- More men died in this movie than women, how could you say that? And again, it goes back to what we were saying, in the drawn outness, the violence about it's it. It's quality over quantity. Exactly. It's the way that they die. It's not how many of their yeah. gender. Because in Saw 3D, being... you get Hoffman like stabbing a bunch of like nameless male cops in the throat. Right. But when it comes to Jill Tuck, a substantial character yeah. with a personality, he's banging her head against a desk, calling her the C word. That is a gendered That's, attack. Yeah, exactly. He's not, he's not taking uh, a male cop and while stabbing and being like, you fucking guy with your penis. Like, that would be the equivalent to that. Yeah. You know, it's not just about the numbers, despite that being the conceit of the kill count. Yeah. And I'm sure that uh, you may already be, th- be thinking of counterexamples, Absolutely. especially if, like, if you don't necessarily agree with the stuff we're talking about. But I would guess that a lot of the counterexamples you're thinking of came out after the point of her writing this book. Because, like we've said, newer movies, it's not as uh, stark. Yeah, you got to keep... Remembering that this is written in 1992 and, and before. And and know. also consider the fact that I haven't covered a lot of 80s slashers. Like, I've done the Friday series and the Nightmare series, but as far as, like, the other stuff that people would be mostly exposed to during that time, I haven't touched on them. Slumber Party Massacre, Sorority House she Massacre. She talks a ton about Slumber Party Massacre. Well, that one's really interesting because it was written and directed That's by women. That's why she talks about it. Which is awesome. I can't wait to cover it eventually. Yeah. But yeah, so just keep in mind that, yeah, the, the movies you see on the kill count aren't necessarily representative of uh, the genre as a whole, especially the genre at the time when Carol Clover is writing about right. it. Right. And that's what, you know, that's, again, that's what academic discourse is, is, you know, someone reads this essay and is like, well, I don't agree with this because this, 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 there's all these examples I can think of. You write your own essay and that's fine. Fuck yeah, dude. You know what? This isn't, again, this is not the end all be all of criticism. Yeah. But I think she makes some cool points here. So I think that at this point we've covered our bases. I think we're good. So please, if you don't get it by now, <laughs> you just won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now we can continue covering sure. this theory. Clover's description and definition of the final girl. She survives. She finds the bodies of her friends and most fully comprehends the peril she's in. Everyone else in the movie, you know, maybe a few seconds before they die, they're like, oh, fuck. And then they get (laughs) murdered. But the final girl is living this entire movie, especially the last act of the movie, knowing that she's probably going to die. Yeah. like She can fully comprehend her peril. She's chased, wounded, rinse, repeat over and over and over again. And quote, she alone looks death in the face, but she alone also finds the strength to either stay the killer long enough to be rescued, ending A, or to kill him herself, ending B. 
Yeah, and this is something that I came to call the Final Girl Circuit in the final uh, in the Friday films uh, yeah. <laughs> when I cover them on the Kill Count because you see the same thing every time. She runs around and she sees all the bodies. You get a nice little review of everyone who's been killed. She often trips mm-hmm. or gets caught in the rain. <laughs> mm-hmm. Sally from Texas Chainsaw Part 1. We're going to use Texas Chainsaw a lot because she explicitly uses Part 1 and Part 2 as bookends to the era of slashers that she's talking about. And part two came out in... 86, I think. Okay. Mid 80s. Yeah. So Sally from uh, Texas Chainsaw Part One is an example of ending A. She defends herself until she's able to be saved by a truck driver. Stretch in part two is an example of ending B. She's the one who kills Chop Top at the end and she swings the chainsaw around like Leatherface in part one. Uh, Laurie Strode from Halloween is also a really good example of part A. Because Dr. Loomis shows up and, and saves, saves her. her. Yeah. yeah, but she like holds off Michael long enough. Right. And that, you know, the fact that she holds him off long enough and Sally does too is, you know, Carol Clover says as the, uh, you know, as the genre develops and years go by, final girls tend towards having endings where they rescue themselves. Nancy? She, she says, right here, Fuck she yeah. says, Nancy from Nightmare on Elm Street uh, is the grittiest final girl. That's like Nancy. a direct quote. She loves Nancy. And <laughs> she she's, mu- Nancy might be my favorite. I love girl. her too. She says that she, and Clover thinks she's the most hard ass of all the final girls because she basically, yeah, she sets off this giant trap at the end and she's gritty and yeah. I wonder if also part of it is like something else you can read into it is like she stands up to her dad right before she like finally has the strength uh, to face Kruger and turn his turn her back to him and then like he's powerless so I wonder if that's like uh something you could read into or write an essay about how uh, I think absolutely that's yeah. pretty loaded <laughs> um but regardless so again you know yeah they even final girls who don't ultimately save themselves they do fend the killer off long enough to be saved and Clover says regardless of the ending Clover thinks who ultimately brings the killer down shouldn't be the point that shouldn't be the main focus. Okay. It's about the quality of the final girl's fight and what about her specifically allows her to survive when no one else can. So she doesn't think that Nancy, even though she thinks she's the grittiest, she doesn't think she's better necessarily than someone like Sally or Lori. You mm-hmm. know, that's not what matters to her. Uh, I do find it interesting, though, that in one counterpoint to the idea that as uh, time goes on, more often the final girl will rescue herself instead of uh, just like staying alive long enough to be rescued is it's kind of the opposite in the Friday the 13th series, which I'm going to be drawing a lot from just because I think that was the most explicit series I've covered with the final girl trope in it. Sure. Uh, Cause it's like just the most basic slashers, which is what yeah. this comes from. And that's the big franchise I'm the least familiar with. So yeah. that'll be helpful. So uh, yeah, apologies to you for that. But uh, the first three films have a final girl who is your standard typical she winds up by herself at the end and she like kills the kills Jason or Pamela, whatever. And then after that, like in part four, the final girl has Tommy as a younger brother. Part five, uh, Pam has another kid running around with her, a male kid. Uh, part six, Tommy is more of like the final boy, but he has a final girl with him. And then from that point on, there's always like a final couple who survives. Mm-hmm. It's like a final girl and a guy. So I find that interesting that uh, as that series progressed, Instead of uh, having a final girl who became more more independent, I guess it became uh, she became kind of more reliant on her co-star final boy. What years was Friday the Thirteenth? So, uh, like the first three were nineteen eighty, and then eighty one and eighty three, or no, I'm sorry. Those 19, are the first three. 80, 80, 81, 82. Okay. And then I think it was like 85. It's interesting because those <laughs> are getting towards the end of this oh, that's slasher true. movement and getting towards, and this is another author we're going to talk about, and we could probably do a whole episode about Robin Wood and his book about, oh shit, what's it called? Hollywood from Vietnam to Reagan. He okay. writes a lot about. Um, I have printed out here his essay about horror in the 80s. Uh, he fucking hates the 1980s. <laughs> um, Robin Wood's book is interesting, but he, I think he would argue that the reason that that happens is because the 80s is when we start getting more reactionary politics, especially gender politics. Hmm. And those movies are moving out of that range of 
you know, the book end of those slashers with final girls that save themselves. So that could be why. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, we don't say, man. We're, we're just, just throwing we're shit just out there. Ta- we're just podcasts. It's just fun to think about shit <laughs> yeah, sometimes. It's fun to just, yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it's about the quality of the final girl's fight. So she's established right away as the main character. She's a bookworm and either isn't sexually active or sexually available. She's obs- You mean not sexually available? She's either either isn't sexually active or sexually available. She's not either of those. Okay. So she, again, she uses the example of stretch from Texas Chainsaw to like she, I don't know, she seems like she could be sexually active maybe, but she turns down a what's his face for a date, uh, her co-worker at the radio station. Want to go for coffee at the big state? Nope. She's observant, sometimes paranoid, and extremely resourceful. She's also shown to be kind of boyish and often has a name that can be unisex, like Stretch Ripley is kind of unisex. She uses Lori as an example. I'm not sure if Lori is unisex, but I thought maybe it's a little less feminine than Lauren or Laura. Yeah. But she uses some examples of, I think like Stevie is another final girl. Can you think Hmm. of any? Well, let me just run through Friday the 13th. Alice, Mm. Uh, Ginny, not quite. But then you have Chris. Okay. Uh, uh trish no is chris the psychic no that's that's part seven and that's Tina. oh that's way later okay. yeah it's way later uh yeah so maybe maybe not in friday the 13th but. yes I, I don't know how well that i thought i'd put it in there but i wasn't mm-hmm. sure how well that held up i yeah. just thought it was an interesting especially ripley you know ripley is a good one yeah because it's like ripley yeah, is a name very masculinized character <laughs> yeah um beyond slashers uh, just horror in general, the protagonists and victims in horror are usually female. So think back to King Kong or Creature from the Black Lagoon, all those movies, you think of the monster holding a beautiful woman. That dynamic has always, always been Dracula. There. Dracula. You They're, always think of the, like the classic yeah. monsters are always, you know, Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. Dracula's never like stalking a, a, dude. a, a dude for <laughs> yeah. his final killer. Yeah, anything. exactly. <laughs> So why does the genre with an extensive history of female protagonists have such a majority male audience, uh, at least at the time of this writing? Many argue the audiences are so male, and this is the center of many other debates over whether or not horror is a harmful genre or is a sexist genre, is that this is because men identify with the killer. They identify with this violence against these female characters, and that's what's going on here, and that's why male audiences... That's why horror mostly has male audiences. This line of thinking argues that horror therefore encourages violence in males and victimization of women. This way of identifying with the killer essentially means that when women watch horror, they're uh, quote unquote betraying their sex and also watching the films from a male point of view because film is usually shot from the male point of view anyways. And it's where we get the idea of the male gaze, which is more just really complicated theory that we, that's another day, probably another podcast. (laughs) But male gaze is essentially a pretty accepted uh, school of film theory that most cinema is shot through the, the male gaze. It's men making movies, it's men writing movies. And so the camera operates as kind of a male point of view, especially, especially when most characters main characters are male yeah and just you know again this is something that a lot of you might bristle at the idea that like the male gaze isn't real but just just imagine and i mentioned this in the nightmare on elm street 2 kill count which i know is in your notes about how like normally when you see a a woman in a movie that's like undressing or the camera you know it lingers on her body Mm -hmm. It, it shows off her body in a way that it rarely does with men and that's why it's so like when you're watching Nightmare on Elm Street 2, you're like, why did these shots seem so weird? Yes. Like it just seems so unfamiliar so to have these close up on his tidy whities. Mm-hmm. And but it's like that's how like think of a uh, was it? I know what you did last summer where there's just all these shots of Jennifer Love Hewitt undressing, yeah. just like the camera's just hugging that body, and that's that's like the default that happens most of the time, probably because. They're men filmmaker, male filmmakers, right. and uh, they're like, this will get the male audience in right. the seats. And that's not, you know, that's beyond opinion, really, especially, you know, pre-1992. Like, that's statistics. Movies are being made by dudes and written by dudes. Like, that's just what Hollywood was. Yeah. And, you know, mostly still is. It's changing. But, 
you know, even just movies in general, your main character is a male and they have a female love interest. And so you're kind of watching the movie through the lens of you're identifying with the main character, the male main character having a female love interest. You're like looking at her. And like wanting to to get her in the end. Right. You know, like like success. Right. You're not meant to watch the movie through the viewpoint of the female character usually. Usually, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So again, that theory gets really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> like this is like you go to film school, you learn about this shit. Yeah. Yeah. But Clover argues, why isn't anyone arguing the opposite? Why do we act like it's impossible for men to identify with women on screen? Critics of horror assume men automatically identify with the male killers because that's what happens in every other movie is men identify with men, but they don't even consider the possibility that men are identifying with the women in horror. These horror films are told from the women's perspective because they're the main character. Mm -hmm. They're not the killer. Clover argues that if a man sees a horror movie and wants to identify with a male character, he's pretty limited in his options. There's boring boyfriends that die right away, maybe some classmates, even a male rescuer who comes in near the end, but he usually gets killed. There's police dads. Come on, Dad. You should at least have her drive out to Cunningham Road and look for him. Megan, my deputy has more important things to do than to look for camp counselors with car trouble. Other authority figures, but they're portrayed as stupid or uncomprehending most of the time. Mm -hmm. Then there's the killer. We don't even see much of him right away because he's often saved for a reveal. But when we do see him, he's masked, he's deformed, he's gross. Yeah. He's not an aspirational which, which is interesting again because again I'm thinking of the counter example of those later Friday films and even like the later Nightmare films and as a series continues you're less and less likely to care about these uh, one time protagonists of the film that come in and you know they're either going to die or that's going to be it for their movie even if they survive they won't be in the next one and so you begin to identify with the killer, with Jason for because Freddy. Because he has and you, kind of an overarching story. And you, you start to root for them. But again, interestingly, that tends to happen after 1986, which Clover has put, again, as the, the end point kind of, of her yeah. discussion. So along with the final girl tending to have more of a uh, final partnership and with the audience more likely to identify with the killer just because the, the rest of the characters are cannon fodder. I find it interesting that those two things, you know, by 1986, that's when they're starting to happen. Yeah. Whereas her her uh, study is looking at movies before that. Yeah. And again, like you said, that's like when you're starting to get reactionary. This but, is interesting. But still, great. But, but even, even so in those movies, if you're looking at those movies at a case-by-case -case basis, are you during the experience of watching the movie, are you still rooting for whoever the main character is by the end? Uh, I'd say that by the time you get to Friday the 13th Part 8, Jason Takes Manhattan. No, you're You're, you're just watching Jason. Jason kill yeah, people. 100%. Okay, 100%. I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking of later Nightmare movies, and I still think... Even though it maybe doesn't work great and you're like, I don't give a fuck about these characters, you're still rooting for what's his fucking daughter's name. Oh, uh, fuck. The Zane? Yeah. <laughs> Lisa the Z Zane. Lisa or Zane. You're still, you're meant to be rooting for her. Yeah. That's and how I'd it's say, structured. I'd say least. that one is like maybe the weakest, but before that, for sure, uh, like Alice, Alice, you yeah. know, you're you're supposed to be really be rude, right? For. As even though we all love Freddy Krueger, yeah. obviously, there's so much Freddy Krueger shit on this <laughs> set now. It's hilarious, but you know the way that the movie's structured, you're meant to be rooting, mm -hmm. and you're you're watching the movie through the perspective of Alice. I can't wait to cover the night, or I'm sorry, the Halloween movies, because uh, mm -hmm. I'm curious to see those. I think four, five, six cover uh like his niece so that is a, a female character to identify with throughout those movies even though by that point you're like i just want to see michael, I just kill see people. michael yeah <laughs> <clears throat> um so then there's our final girl as the only other character of substance to identify with she's again introduced at the beginning so we immediately know to identify with her She's intelligent, and I think key is that she's the character that comes the closest to having the same understanding of the situation that the audience does. Mm -hmm. 
So she's the one who we feel the least compelled to yell through the screen at, you know? Yeah. She kind of comes the closest to having the audience's privileged point of view. She's like, she gets the whole picture. Yeah. You know? Something, something's wrong here. There's right. danger about Like Nancy. <laughs> Nancy knows what's up. Mm-hmm. She's yelling at everyone else in the movie. Like, we also want to yell at everyone else in the movie. Yeah. She, uh, we cheer when she defeats the killer and feel horror when she finds her mutilated friends. She's the hero and we're rooting for her at the end. So, you know, regardless of, it's still, you know, when you're watching these movies, you're still having fun watching the killer kill everyone. Like, okay, the first Nightmare movie, it's still great to watch Freddy kill everyone and it's a like great <laughs> fun time, but you still, you know, it's fun to watch Nancy win in the end. You're still rooting for her and the ending, therefore, is a huge bummer, you know? Yeah the like weird cop out like yeah, weird ending that's why that ending is so frustrating because you just want her to win <laughs> yeah. you know <laughs> so you're rooting for her you are really like viewing this world through her so at this point you know this idea of pov and viewing the movie through the final girl many may be wondering what's with all the pov shots in slashers then and you know famously halloween were put in the mask of the killer and were forced to identify with him and that mm-hmm. happens a lot in in horror psycho does it black christmas black christmas the first friday the 13th yeah the second one Mm -hmm. this is another huge point that critics of horror like to bring up you know these movies encourage violence because we as an audience are encouraged to empathize with the killer clover brings up the fact that still in the end we are inarguably aligned with the final girl these pov shots often serve as a way to keep the killer's identity a surprise they're just like a filmmaking method to make the reveal of who the killer is shocking i think you know one of the best examples is pamela Voorhees. exactly yeah as um, unlikely as it may be right it's, exactly it's so funny but when that's you compare, why it's like... such a great surprise <laughs> yeah. and why the pov works and i uh, you know another great reveal is the the pov of michael myers is you don't realize at first he's a kid yeah it's and it's easy to forget it's that, it's so easy to forget that you're not supposed to know that yeah because now when we watch it's like oh this is when he's a kid and he kills his sister but like when you when audiences first watch that they yeah, didn't know that and it's so dark mm-hmm. when you realize that yeah you've been behind the mask of this little boy the entire time yeah so i think you know it probably functions more as just a filmmaking method of oh it's a surprise kind of reveal She also mentions that if you're using this line of logic, that POV automatically equals identification, that it's insane to think that the POV shots in Jaws means that you're (laughs) supposed to be the shark the whole time, or that the POV shots in the birds means that you're supposed to root for the birds. Like that's, you know, that line of reasoning starts to fall apart when you look at other horror movies. I root for the birds. Yeah. Yeah. Clover's very good, by the way, at addressing counterpoints. Like, she she knows as she's writing what people are probably thinking as she's laying out her points, and she's very good at addressing. I think that, in general, uh, that is one of the best things you can possibly do just in anything. Yeah. I, always, uh, I always do that method. Like, even when I'm explaining changes to the channel, I'm always like, I know what you're thinking, da 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 da, and then address it. You like, if, if you can think about what someone may have, uh, the argument someone may have against what you're saying, address it. Yeah. And it's also a good way it's to good essay writing. It, yeah. It's a good way to like <laughs> strengthen your argument yeah. because if you can't come up with a good response to that, yeah. Maybe rethink what you're saying, you know? Yeah. She's also really good, too, at, like, she acknowledges so many times in this essay that she's like, again, this is me trying to process this idea that I have. And certain things, you know, they don't quite add up. And it's fine to have questions about this. Specifically, she has a whole section of this essay dedicated to, like, well, what is happening when women watch these movies? Because this whole essay kind of discounts that experience. And she's like, you know, it would require just a whole other analysis but that'll make more sense once I get more into this other stuff. It's going to get weird, by the way. Oh, it gets pretty weird because it's academia. Ac- <laughs> academia, academia gets fucking weird, If man. you think academia is boring, <laughs> underneath the layer of boringness is so much wild shit that when you actually start to dissect it, it's like, oh, man, so much weird good stuff. I think that's why I liked my horror theory class so much is because it's like, it's just wild. I yeah. love it. I love it so much. So at this point, you may also be wondering, why aren't there more female killers then? And why aren't there more final boys? At first, that answer seems simple. Just, you know, even the straight up 
pretty obvious subtext that the slasher's method of killing is often really phallic and really (laughs) sexually symbolic and therefore kind of requires the killer to present as male. So if you had any doubts about that, the famous scene in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, I think is the best. Like, you can't not analyze that scene (laughs) as chainsaw equals dick do you want to kind of explain yeah and you've seen the movie more recently i watched it like while i was researching this yeah yeah. and for me it's been a long time but i did use the clip in a kill count probably for leprechaun 3 because the actress who plays stretch is the chicken leprechaun 3 who gets blown up she's great i really like her yeah she's awesome but in that scene in texas chainsaw massacre 2 which is near the end no, it's near the beginning, actually. Oh, wow. Well, she's confronted by Leatherface. It's when they first get into the radio station. Kind okay. Of and he goes to kill her with his chainsaw, but then he ends up very, uh, in a very sexually confused sort of way, like putting the chainsaw up against her, her yeah. crotch. How good are you? Huh? So, yeah, this super sexualized phallic violence you know a knife is very phallic machete machete it's all these phallic symbols it could you know be read as an on-screen representation of man on woman sexual violence or just pure distilled rage against the feminine you know man on woman violence and that's how many people again read horror but not clover not clover this argument clover believes breaks down once you start examining the masculinity and femininity of the killer and the final girl the killer's masculinity is extremely compromised. If this was supposed to be, if horror, or the slasher at least, is supposed to be a representation of pure man-on-woman violence, you know, this anger between the sexes, the killer's masculinity wouldn't be so gray. Mm -hmm. And again, so compromised. You've got Norman Bates with, quote, you know, the mother half of his mind. That's Mm -hmm. how it's described in the movie. Leatherface's impotent chainsaw jason's mommy issues and his eternal boyhood um michael myers seems trapped in eternal boyhood even though he's a you know he's a man in the movie but the way everyone talks about him you know the the famous speech dr loomis gives where he describes meeting michael myers he's describing him as a child Mm -hmm. he's always kind of talked about in that movie as a kid i don't think anyone's ever calling him a man or addressing him as a man they're always talking about this like haunted child that they've met i met this Six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. I spent eight years trying to reach him and then another seven trying to keep him locked up because I realized that what was living behind that boy's eyes was purely and simply evil. Trying to think of, so if we expand like past the 86 kind of bookmark here, I'm trying to think of like maybe Victor Crowley from the Hatchet movies. He's uh, he's much more masculine. He has like daddy issues, which is interesting. Uh, yeah, that's still, rep- you know, it's it's like a weird, it's a family fixation and mm-hmm. it, yeah, kind of. I'm trying to, th- uh, Chucky is never really uh, like upset in a gender way, but like. He's in a doll's body. I was going to say he's, he's in a doll body and he <laughs> That's very I think one of the issues he has with it is he doesn't have a dick, you know. Well, no, he says he's anatomically oh, correct in Bride of Chucky. Oh yeah. <laughs> he's not a man. He's like he's in a little kid doll body. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm even like, like looking at what our What about like Freddy? He seems okay. But he also there's the weird thing of him he you know, I implied guess, child molester. Yeah, yeah. And he, has, he like, kills kids. Sexual issue. Yeah, yeah, instead of like it's, he's not a he's not a man killing other men, he's killing kids. Right. Until There's he's supernatural. Weird uh, stuff the there. xenomorph is all kinds of like it's phallic. Oh, the but xenomorph it, is in this essay a lot. Especially the xenomorph the one is the, like the Frankenfurter of horror creatures. I it's mean, like the xenomorph both. is a big dick. Yeah, and, but it's also like kind of sexy. And it like face yeah. huggers look like vaginas. Yeah, and you know the su- in aliens. Mm-hmm. She she even mentions aliens in this essay. I don't have it in here, but she mentions that aliens, the most horrifying monster of all, is the egg laying. You know. Oh, like the the throat rape. The mo- of- yeah. yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. this mother figure, this horrifying mother. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, uh, but also like yeah, like men's fear of of rape. Yeah, with, like the face hugger. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
And yeah, horror monsters are all weird sexuality, which if you want to read it. <laughs> Just a Hellraiser. <laughs> oh, my God. If you want to read an even, you know, a really comprehensive uh, book or, you know, series of essays about that kind of representation, like, what you know, monsters representing repressed weird sexuality. Again, Robin Wood's book mm-hmm. and his essays, um, you know, I have the American Nightmare Horror in the 70s and Horror in the 80s. He talks about how horror is about this like representation of repression and sexuality that our culture finds terrifying Mm. and therefore has to present itself as monsters even going back to the universal monsters are like uh yeah the creature from the black lagoon i think that's why shape of water is like kind of a black lagoon type creature because that creature is always represented weird sexuality yeah anyway i don't want to get too off track (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah so basically all the killers and slashers are weird like man babies kind of <laughs> oh wait no there's okay so there's also the trope i i do want to address it because it's there the trope of the killer as a cross-dresser or a transgender person which i don't feel qualified to talk about in this episode i think could be its own episode but basically the the killer's male self is extremely feminized or in some way compromised that's her you know idea of what the killer buffalo is. bill Sure. And yeah. that came out probably after she wrote this. Oh, that was, yeah, 1991. Or no. So yeah, it would have been around the same time. Yeah. 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 On the other hand, you have the masculinity of the final girl. She's masculine in the ways we've discussed before, but she's also masculine in that she assumes a role on screen typically reserved for men. She's the active participant in the film and goes looking for the killer. Clover cites this quote from John Carpenter after Halloween was criticized for condemning female sexuality. So Halloween gets a lot of uh, flack for, you know, it, it kills characters after they have sex. And a lot of people interpret that as it's murdering women for having sex and it's punishing, you know, the bad girls and rewarding the good girl who doesn't have sex and she gets to survive. But this is what John Carpenter says. They, the critics, completely missed the boat there, I think. Because if you turn it around, the one girl who is the most sexually uptight just keeps stabbing this guy with a long knife. She's the most sexually frustrated. She's the one that killed him. Not because she's a virgin, but because of all that repressed energy starts coming out. She uses all those phallic symbols on the guy. She and the killer have a certain link. Sexual repression. So even John Carpenter is like... Yeah, it's all fallacies. <laughs> In case you're thinking, nah, it's everyone reading into it. John Carpenter is like, no. Nah. Yeah, no, the knife's a dick. The knife's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a thing. I think at this point, it's a thing that horror people were all on board with that weapons are dicks. Weapons are dicks. They're yo. dick stand ins. And if you think that's weird. Yeah, so, okay, <laughs> buckle up because this is when. This essay gets real weird, and it's stuff that all makes sense once you kind of mull it over. Well, yeah. I think this is also one of these types of things where, you know, if you want to look at this and be like, fucking academics, like, they just overthink things and get weird with it. Sure. That's an interpretation. That's fair. Sure. Because, uh, yeah, this again, if you, so if you, you know, either you're not in college yet, or if, you know, you didn't take many college courses or you didn't go to college or you didn't yeah or you didn't go to college and you don't have a ton of experience with this kind of academia it this might be like what the fuck (laughs) yeah yeah academia gets weird man it does it gets very weird but you know what sometimes that weirdness stumbles onto something good yeah i just think it's a good way of (laughs) opening your brain up to think about stuff in different ways yeah so here we go. Let's get weird. (laughs) Let's get into it. The brains are messy man. Yeah. So we're just trying to explain that mess. The Final girl at the end, Clover argues, essentially goes through a kind of puberty and gains a phallus by castrating the killer when she gets the weapon. (laughs) I have in caps, this is when things get weird. (laughs) (laughs) This kind of symbolism of the final girl basically gaining a dick and entering adulthood is an explicit contrast to the killer who is de-penised after living his entire life as a man baby in a weird psychosexual relationship with his mom or family. Yeah. Yeah. We good? Should I just keep going? (laughs) Just keep going. All right. Let's dig in. The killer's ending is tragic in that he essentially becomes feminized via castration. And the final girl is victorious because she fully realizes her masculinity after acquiring a phallus. Nice. It's not. And again, I want to stress, because I don't know if she makes this explicitly clear, but it's this is at least how I interpret her her writing. Mm -hmm. It's not that the killer becomes a woman. Yeah. It's that he remains 
a child. Yeah. He remains a man baby because he never gets his adult dick. <laughs> um, and it's the reason I think that this is the case is because we typically gender young kids as feminine, boys and girls. This or at might, least we used to. We used to. We don't. It, this is changing a lot. Um, but before kids came of age, especially before the like World War One, World War One, before the time that uh, teenagers were a thing, we yeah. didn't always have teenagers. Teenagers are a recent thing. Yeah. I would say mid-century is when we start calling, you know, kids in their teens teenagers. Yeah, before it was just you were a kid, and, and then, then you, you were, were an adult. adult, and you were ready to go to work, and that was usually at like. 14, 15? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so, at 15, especially if you were male, it's like, you're an adult You're now. an adult now, yeah. So, so uh, think on that, all you fucking 15-year-olds who are playing video <laughs> games. You would have had to work in the mines. Yeah. Go to war. But before, you know, before you, quote, unquote, become a man in that time when mm-hmm. you're a kid, you know, kids are just kind of genderless. They're, they're kids. They're just kids. They're just kids. And so up until pretty recent history, and we're talking starting from like the 1500s-ish, up until the early 1900s, young boys wore dresses. Mm-hmm. Um, pink was a masculine color and blue was a feminine color because the Virgin Mary, I think. But m- more importantly, young boys all wore dresses. And the ceremonial shift from a boy wearing a dress to wearing pants was called breaching. And I actually, when I was looking this up, and I'll link this in this the, great. I'll link this in the description. But uh, I found a picture of F.D. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt wearing a little dress, and he has long hair and a feathered cap. And I found one of Ernest Hemingway too, yeah. the manliest <laughs> man of like all the time. Man. There's a picture of him, and he's smiling, and he's got like blonde curly hair, and he's in a little white dress. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, we we have this idea of young kids being feminine, mm-hmm. which again is not. To us, maybe it sounds weird. Yeah. But, but it was like, yeah, the, the separation was like so. men, women, women, and children. Women, yes. Yeah. Exactly. Children were kind of grouped with women. That's yeah. So keep that in your pocket because that'll come back later. Kids, feminine, or, you know, they're not masculine. Not masculine. Right. They're, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, another reason that Clover argues contributes to the phenomenon of primarily female victim is the history of established language in film. Like we discussed earlier, the male gaze is an assumed thing, and that gaze knows how to shoot women and fetishize them in a way that it doesn't know how to shoot men. So, for example, you know, so film sees men and women differently, sees men, quote unquote, sees them differently. Men get to display anger and force on film, crying, screaming, begging, fainting, whatever that's reserved for women. Mm -hmm. And I think a movie that proves that so well and makes you realize how like ingrained that language is, that cinematic language is, is Nightmare on Elm Street 2. Mm-hmm. Because when you see a man acting exactly like a woman would and honestly being realistically terrified and screaming, yeah. it seems so weird to us and it seems immediately feminine. Everyone says he screams like a girl. Yeah. You've got the body. I've got the brain. So all this kind of, it it comes around to Clover's main argument for why the final girl is a thing. The final girl is an acceptable stand-in for a young adolescent male. So Hank, stay with me. She's feminine enough to scream and cry and be scared in a way that is thrilling to identify with. So in horror, it's more fun to feel vulnerable alongside with the characters. I think horror, you feel less vulnerable less scared if the final girl is instead like a strong dude it's a different dynamic but she's masculine enough for a male audience to feel good about identifying with yeah right it's like oh she's she's not like those other girls she's not yeah exactly <laughs> she's not you know a, a dumb i don't know bimbo <laughs> yeah sure um yeah she's not hysterical she's strong and right and resourceful so yeah so she's a good middle ground she's a character where it's like okay masculine enough for for dudes to feel comfortable enough identifying with but feminine and vulnerable enough to make it thrilling to make it exciting Mm -hmm. right and again that's why it's important to remember this like feminine equivalence with 
like younger kids and like kids pre-puberty mm-hmm. and like boys in dresses it's, it's like yeah a girl could be a stand-in for an adolescent teen boy yeah you know which is a large portion of the horror audience she does yeah she does address the dilemma this puts female viewers in and doesn't have a definitive answer she kind of questions you know even whether it's kind of fucked up that men have to make a female <laughs> character masculine and able to empathize with her while women are just expected to empathize with male characters period yeah um, again, this this is changing. Mm-hmm. 1992, when this is written. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear it. <laughs> 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 then she wonders, okay, taking all of this into account, can't this phenomenon of a female main character also just be explained away by the enjoyment of the taboo of a male viewer experiencing femaleness? And she thinks that that's fair because horror is all about taboo, so it makes sense that it's also a genre where a man can step into a woman's shoes and play around a little bit with yeah. with gender. It adds to the thrill of a horror movie. That makes sense. Yeah. This play with gender and the uncertainty it provides is also demonstrated in the identity of the killer. Again, we often have reveals that the killer is actually a woman when you've assumed it's a man, like Pamela Voorhees or Norm Bates for vice versa. I think horror's got to be the genre that most fucks around with gender. Yeah. In the I mean like the explicit way that it does. Sometimes in the not nice way it does, but it does. Mm-hmm. It's like the genre I think where you can play around with that the most. It's yeah, it's the genre most linked to sex. Absolutely. Even romantic comedies aren't as much about like romance movies aren't as much about sex as horror movies are. Yeah, and horror's like sexual anxiety. Yeah. And repressed sexual urges. Yeah. There's... Especially in America where we repress sex. And we don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And we have this weird, like, yeah, we're obsessed with sex, but we repress it. And that's why I think it just comes out, you know, in horror. And again, this is a Robin Wood argument where, like, sex is so, you know, um, intertwined with horror because it's, like, a repressed thing that to American culture is, like, a nightmare. Like, weird, like, sexuality that isn't the norm. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, white bread standard, like, acceptable norm for American culture is this nightmare that haunts us. Like, we're so afraid of sex in America that that's why horror is so sexual. And that's another thing that's changing, for sure. Absolutely. We're not nearly as repressed about it as when these movies were coming out in the 80s. Oh, my God, yeah, yeah, (laughs) Jesus. Yeah. But we still have uh, just kind of a weird relationship with it. We absolutely do. You know, compared to, like, maybe Europe uh or even other non-western societies where like you know the boob isn't as sexualized in other cultures as with us and that's why we have debates over whether or not you can breastfeed in public is because we're just so sexually charged afraid of boobs it's It's crazy oh but but how can i restrain myself if i see a tit i just always think it's so funny when you're live streaming and you're editing and you're like (laughs) you accidentally scrub past a boob and you're like fuck and it's crazy that that could get scrub to the decapitation yeah oh yeah let's get yeah let's get to this dude getting his like legs ripped off <laughs> it's nuts like we're so afraid of sex and that like horror just takes that and runs with it you know yeah because yeah, it is our collective nightmare in this country <laughs> for sure especially sex that is weird and makes us uncomfortable that mm-hmm. isn't like stuff we approve of horror is constantly messing around with gender boundaries and it constantly reinforces that gender doesn't allow us to predict behavior and Carol argues positions gender as theater and extremely fluid. So again, this the reveal, like Pamela Voorhees, we use her as an example a lot. She's a great example. We can't, you know, this behavior, we don't predict that that's an, a middle-aged woman by the end. <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, it makes, you know, it, it kind of presents her gender as weirdly fluid because she acts in the way that's like the opposite of what we would expect for her gender. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, horror uses gender as theater. And this flexibility of gender that horror consistently offers is another reason why the predominantly male audience feels comfortable assuming the perspective of the final girl, because horror has this precedent of setting up a space where it's fine yeah. to kind of mess around with gender in that way. So it's, you know, that's why Carol loves horror so much and why she thinks it's so fascinating is because it's a genre that sets this precedent for it's okay for a man to identify with a female character and no one questions it, mm-hmm. you know. In Clover's opinion, absolute fear is still gendered feminine, but horror's unique portrayal of its female main character suggests a shift towards self-rescue and determination not being strictly masculine anymore. So it's kind of a double, 
edge sword because we're still in this space where fear on screen um at least you know the fear that is most exciting to experience as a horror viewer is kind of a feminine experience like we still it's more thrilling to see women in danger than men yeah again something that's changing yeah i'm just trying to think of uh so again there's probably tons of counter examples but my mind is just going to some the early friday the 13th movies and just like yeah kevin bacon uh he doesn't he doesn't have time to be afraid he gets blood dripped on him and then he's like what and then killed yeah. whereas his girlfriend marcy i think her name is uh goes to the bathroom in her underwear yeah and long shots of her in her underwear and then when she's attacked she survives for long enough to like get the React, close-ups of yeah. her screaming and like mm-hmm. terrified acts in her face uh same thing with like no, 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 that's my example. But yeah, it's something where you more often, you're seeing women react like that. Yeah. You don't often have men screaming and, and begging for their lives. A horror completely upends the trope of only men having active roles and propelling the story forward. The woman becomes the investigator and the spectator of the action. So again, that's different now, but it's cool to look back and see how horror, horror is the genre where we get more of that earlier. Like horror is kind of ahead of, every other genre in terms of representation and you know i think horror is constantly expanding the boundaries of what's acceptable to do in a movie that it'll push them out a little bit and then more mainstream movies will adapt that and be like okay this is our new boundary we can go that far and then horror will be like yeah but let's push it a little bit further now Mm -hmm. and it's just that back and forth yeah clover's closing paragraph is this and i think it pretty neatly sums up her attitude towards the the slasher One is deeply reluctant to make progressive claims for a body of cinema that uh, is as spectacularly nasty toward women as the slasher film is. But the fact is that the slasher does, in its own perverse way and for better or for worse, constitute a visible adjustment in the terms of gender representations. That is an adjustment largely on the male side, appearing at the furthest possible remove from the quarters of theory and showing signs of trickling upward is of no small interest in the study of popular culture. So basically what she means is it's super cool that this evolution is happening with male audiences, male filmmakers, male right. Like these are movies made by men for men mostly. Mm-hmm. Again, that's generalizing, but when you look at the numbers, that's what that's what's going on. Especially back then. Especially back then. But there's this weird uh, shift in attitude towards gender and, and representation on film coming from men who don't necessarily, they don't have an imperative to. It's just, it represents a genuine shift in how men see the world and see women and, and people of other genders. And she also thinks it's fascinating that it's happening in these movies that these aren't art films. These aren't <laughs> trying to be, um, maybe they're not actively trying to be progressive or, or push boundaries in that way, but they are. Yeah. And that represents, it's like this is actually becoming ingrained in society is this progression of how we view each other. If it's not consciously happening. Exactly. This Mm -hmm. isn't happening in like high art films or um, this isn't like, you know, this isn't being influenced by like theory and stuff. It just is like naturally (laughs) happening. happening. Yeah. And um, yeah, so that's why she thinks it's a tragedy that people would look over what many would consider low cinema. Yep. That's why she loves slashers is because that kind of stuff's happening there. And I think, you know, she really did a service to that genre. I think the way we look at those movies would be really different if she didn't write this book. Yeah. I Man, I miss covering slashers on my channel. She, it, she makes me appreciate slashers a lot more. Yeah. Slashers are fun. They're simple. And it's been so long since I've, I've covered them. Yeah. I hope that this was interesting mm-hmm. i think it was yeah yeah because it's i mean it's academia it gets a little yeah, you know it's academic as fuck but i mean yeah it, i try i really tried hard to cliff notes this because you know a lot of the language she uses you have to already be familiar with a lot of film theory to know what the fuck she's talking about i think it's hard to sit and read this book if yeah you if know you're not familiar with those terms and yeah. just uh shorthand uh i think that for anyone who is reluctant to uh get into the academic side of things listen if you're listening to this or watching this or you're a fan of this channel you're probably pretty into horror movies and i know i was when i was younger i was 
fucking obsessed with them, and I still am. And I think that if you if you have that kind of passion for something, and you already devote that much time and energy towards it, it's worth considering uh, just thinking a little bit more deeply about it. Like you can you can always turn your brain off and enjoy these movies, and that's fine. And I do that, and everyone does that. It's something fun to do. But also, occasionally, maybe just allow yourself to think a little bit deeper about, like, what's going on underneath all these movies? Because, Mm -hmm. you know, even if it's not intentional, like you were saying at the end there, there's, there's these collective ideas that go into the creation of these horror movies that's worth considering at least. And yeah. Maybe you'll agree with some of the, some of it. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll think some of it is fucking horse pucky. Yeah. That's a term, right? Sure. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Like there was okay. some, like one thing I can think of and you know, I, like I said many times, I fucking love this book. I love this essay. I loved it even more after having to analyze it so closely. One thing in it, I super disagree with. She talks about Ripley from Alien and she argues that Ripley isn't a great feminist development she's like if if you know we're going with this theory that this final girl is just kind of a male stand-in she's more of like a male wish fantasy in in an acceptable way for men to feel fear and she isn't necessarily like a intentional like girl power movie Mm. which you know you can't take Ripley away from me. <laughs> Ripley for me is very empowering. So that's something where I'm like, I disagree. Yeah. You know, but that's, you know. That's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so there's a, I'm going to link to a piece. This is in Medium about how this theory holds up with more modern examples. And this has a pretty uh, thorough list of more modern movies. I think she talks a lot about Hush. Uh, other movies that are, yeah, pretty new. Then there's also a piece from i think the film journal off screen about european horror because she doesn't talk about european horror at all so if mm-hmm. you're familiar with european horror you might be you might have just been screaming at us the whole time yeah because this is very like a merocentric is that a word uh, it is now okay <laughs> <laughs> but this piece talks about how european horror is super different in terms of subtext and female characters especially since europe's like you know uh europe and the relationship with sexuality is extremely different than America's. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot, you know, the subtext is different in European horror. The female characters are different. And so this article writes a lot about movies that I've never seen. And I think if you are interested in that, this is really good and really uh, concise. And they all also link to the piece about little boys wearing dresses. That's fun. Yeah. With really cool pictures. All right. So that's that. Yeah. I hope that that was interesting. I know. All. Yeah, shed some light, shed a lot of light on what uh, before now on this channel has just been referred to offhandedly as Final Girl, as mm-hmm. an accepted trope. Yeah, Final we just, Girl. I got my Final Girl shirt on. Nice. We just dug yeah, down Yeah, you see Final it. Girl, like we were at Texas Frightmare and there was a bunch of all our Final Girl merch, like different, you know, stuff yeah. that says Final Girl on it. Like she, you know, and she's a, a thing that a lot of women feel empowered by. And so I was like, let's just let's dive into it. Yeah, real quick before we go, I know this is already a long episode, but we would be remiss if we didn't thank the people who have sent stuff to our P.O. box. Please feel free to do so. Yeah. Anything you want to send us, any fan stuff, any, uh, I don't know, goodies, uh, we'll we'll have the address in the description. Uh, I don't feel like reading it off on on camera. It's in the description. Well, or you I'll know put what? up a graphic. Yeah, it's 13535 okay. Ventura Boulevard, Sweet C, PMB 423, Sherman Oaks, California, 91423. That's for all our audio listeners. There it is. So thank you, Raven, who sent us a lovely note on this fucking uh, very bright coral card that she apologizes for. But you know what, Raven? I love it. Thank you. I know. You. I thought it was cute. Yeah, it's very good. It's just a very nice letter about uh you know how it's it's helped uh, i mean she's always been a hor- huge horror fan and it's uh she appreciates the breaking down and analysis of them so Yay. we like that too also uh fellow horror creators neon brainiacs, neon brainiacs. yeah new episodes available on itunes every wednesday so uh it's an 80s horror podcast if you if you want to get more deep into the 80s horror that uh, that's also slashers there's sure also slashers talk- a lot of stuff that this essay Absolutely. and episode we'll probably talk about uh they also sent us some dvds slaughter drive which is which is yeah. fun and are these are these movies that they made i believe so i believe it is so that's fun that's and, amazing uh bpo films mixtape volume volume one looks like a bunch of uh, a collection of short films so 
Uh, That's awesome. I haven't had the time to check these out yet, but I, I hope Plan to. Plan on it. So thank you, uh, Neon Brainiacs. We also got a whole bunch of these very cool pins from the Friday the 13th Killer Puzzle oh, game. Oh, man. I which, got so excited. When as you know, we are, we are featured in. Yeah. We did a single live stream of us playing that game, but that was before our characters were in it. Yeah. So you know what? We're probably going to have to do another one where we reach we the level. We definitely will. I think we're on level 11. Something like that. We'll, That's we'll a far away. We'll reach the level where we get to kill ourselves. And yes. in, uh, <laughs> while we're doing that, we can maybe do a giveaway. Yeah. Of all these extra pins that they gave we're us. We're keeping some. We're, yeah, we're keeping <laughs> one set. But like we can't give them all away. They're very awesome. I they're love nice the Pamela head. Too. Yeah, they're very good pins as people yeah. make pins. Finally, last but not least... <laughs> If oh, you are familiar this. with Sleepaway Camp, it's one of my favorite slashers, one of my favorite horror movies. Oh, we're obsessed with Sleepaway Camp. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We got this in the mail. Yeah. Um, wait, do you want to explain? Sure. Uh, Karen Fields, who plays Judy, the uh, like bitchy She's character in that movie. Sleepaway yeah. Camp. Uh, you may, if you're familiar with my Monster Palooza video from 2017, we had a happenstance run into her and yes, just we uh, met her and her daughter mm-hmm, impromptu interview with her she was very sweet her and her daughter izzy were both very nice and her daughter izzy is actually studying to be a makeup artist she, guys she just got in she's in the tom savini program That's right. like she's, holy she's shit. studying under tom savini yeah. to make horror movie makeup which is amazing. amazing and so izzy reached out to us her her mother karen was uh willing to sign a curling iron for us. Oh my god! With the quote on it, "A real carpenter's dream." Yep. And uh, I'm just very excited to have this this autographed curling if iron. If you've seen Sleepaway Camp, you know why. You, this you know is why it's a thing. Ass, yeah. yeah. So. So thank you both so much. Thank you. This was very exciting to get in the mail. Yeah. So again, <laughs> if you feel like sending anything to us physical, hit us up there. If it if you're. Uh, the thing you want to send is more digital. Go ahead and email us at deadmeatpod at gmail.com. Chelsea's always checking that email mm-hmm. and responding uh, to those. Mm-hmm. You can find the Dead Meat channel on YouTube. Uh, Dead Meat. It's there. It's something with the algorithm lately, man. It's been crazy. I'm just, I think kids are out of school. I think kids are out of school <laughs> and they found up. this channel and so it's blowing up. We appreciate up. it a lot. Thank you very much I'm for that. so scared that you have a bunch of new subscribers and this will be the first podcast episode and they'll be like what the fuck yeah is that's this right shit? if you're new to the channel welcome I'm if you've made it this sc- far i'm out of school for summer fuck this shit i don't want school <laughs> we should have said that up top like hey we know you're out of school but here's some learning anyway yeah i it's think fun that's learning fun. it's fun to learn we talked so much about dick you're gonna miss when all you had to do was learn. You're going to miss it so much. All right? Because that's way better than having to work <laughs> or else you starve. Get ready for adulthood. Uh, also, you can find me on social media <laughs> at Dead Meat James. That's on Twitter and Instagram. Chelsea? I'm at Carebeck. That's C-A-R-E-B-E-C-C on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want merch, like the final girl shirt. Mm-hmm. And our own pins. And Yeah, that's uh, deadmeatstore.com. That's right. And also be sure to rate and review this podcast on whatever you're listening to, especially Please. if it's it helps iTunes. a lot. It does. I recently discovered that you can read more than just three reviews if you actually have iTunes. I didn't have iTunes. I'm, I'm not an Apple person. So every time I would go to our review, our, our podcast on the iTunes website, mm-hmm. I would just see the same three reviews and be like, what the fuck? No one's leaving yeah, any reviews. but there's actually a ton. There's like so we many. Really there's hundreds. So them. I spent like a good couple hours the other day just going through and reading them all and they're all so pleasant i think we have a solid five stars on there don't fuck that up please don't fuck that please up. don't fuck that i will up. say the reviews that haunt me the most are the three and four stars where it's like <laughs> i'd rather have you be like i fucking hate this thing yeah but what? it's like what, like force like what you know like what did I, it haunts me <laughs> like what, what could we have what done? did we do to lose the one star <laughs> i feel like um do you remember that episode of Hey Arnold where Helga's sister gets like an A minus? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's how That's I feel. Right. I forgot about Helga's perfect sister, <laughs> yeah. Olga. Olga. Yeah. Like, I, that, that minus is haunting me. <laughs> but they, yeah, we super appreciate it. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for listening. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week. I hope so. I'm getting eye surgery tomorrow. I don't know how long it'll we take to recover. We don't know how. Yeah. 
But we'll if see. we're doing episodes like this where they're not as edit heavy, that makes it easier for me. So chances are you will get an episode next week. Probably a movie we'll review. We'll see how much pain I'm in. And it, it's, you know what? We haven't settled on a movie yet. If you want us to review a specific movie, let us know in the comments. We're open to suggestions. Yeah, we haven't. Because all our brains keep going to our fucking 90s and That's early 2000s movies. Because yeah. I'm looking for idle hands sometimes. But uh, <laughs> anyway... If you're still listening, thank you very much. And we'll see you on the next episode. Uh, Until then, I'm James. I'm Chelsea. This has been the Dead Me Podcast. Play that music.